Yes. And you think that some people with that kind of equilibrium can feel the same or yeah. are more protected, I mean, yeah. from that bad influence? Right. So I think, I think it'd be important to, to separate what, what is the, you know, kind of the, the, the resonant aspect of empathy. The, you know, that occasioned by the simulation in the brain of others, you know, pain and distress as if it were one's own, and the processes that are important for perspective taking and emotion regulation. Because I think those latter are the things that enable one to, you know, both have the empathic response, but then be able to do something that comes to the aid of the other individual, rather than just having it feel shitty and you want to move out of the situation. Yeah, my, just to clarify that, <coughs> my experience was when I saw that girl uh, came up there, that small photograph, I think oh. she had her mouth open yeah. screaming or something. Yeah. I could feel that in mm -hmm. my energy field. Mm -hmm. But I had a deeper, um, stronger connection to the life force. Uh, and it's out of this stability that I was able to feel this at a certain more superficial level and not let it overwhelm me. Now, if I didn't have that deeper connection or deeper stability of consciousness, that could have overwhelmed me, and I could have that empathy that you're talking mm -hmm. about with the reaction yeah. and all that. So, fine, fine. it's yeah. really, it's a question yeah. of depth and connection to your uh, higher or inner consciousness, universal consciousness. Yeah, and that, that's what I was speaking about as the you know perspective taking and emotion regulation kind of aspects, Carol. I'm trying to get my head around the uh, idea that the default network is, I, I mean, I, I actually I hate the idea of the default network because I don't think the brain wastes energy doing stuff that is not useful. Ah, well, I, I, think, I think it's useful. Okay, but so what, but we don't, it, maybe it's not a default, maybe it's an actual, so what you're trying to say is that this is an actual self-understanding or self-awareness or, or, I, or I, th I think I think when we don't have anything else to do <laughs> which doesn't happen to anybody in this room <laughs> but you're using past experience you're remembering you're engaging in prospection sometimes we call that planning that that's useful that it's also useful in understanding self in relationship to other because you know being able to, to understand the perspective of others seems to require using these same systems we simulate using our own memory and, and, and projection so I, I don't think that either there's anything wrong with that or <coughs> that that isn't adaptive I think that does allow us to plan I think the problem is when you get stuck in that so when you know you say something to me and you're trying to describe your difficult situation and what starts happening is I think, oh shit, that's just like the problem I'm having with you know, <laughs> and suddenly you think, where the hell did he go? You know, and his eyes are glazed over. And so I think you know the, the effort in these kind of practices is not to get rid of of the self in that sense. It's to be able to flexibly modulate, you know, to be able to uh, allow that to quiet down when the task is being with somebody else or being, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the world at large. So is, is this the difference between your, your short-term meditators and long-term meditators? Is it a difference in terms of cognitive control, emotional control, or is it a difference in the experience of the, the emotion itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my, my hypothesis is, is it's the latter that the short-term meditators are actually the ones who are doing more post-arousal regulation, the effortful regulation, after the emotion is already <coughs> initiated. But I think what's shifting for the long-term meditators is that much less becomes self-relevant. So, well, well, so is it that it becomes, it doesn't become self-relevant or can they stop it from? So I'm thinking, I'm wondering whether you can, in, like in some of the experiments where people say, I want you to stop yourself mm -hmm. now from feeling this. Mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. do they have that ability mm -hmm. to, to shift from one state yeah. to another, or do they stop the state from occurring? No, that's a good question. Things? Empirically, I don't think we know. The relevant studies haven't been done. That's a good question. Um, my expectation would be that you'd see some of both. 
based mostly on uh, some experiments that have to do with set shifting and uh, you know stroop performance and, and those kinds of, of things that should be relevant. Uh, but that also, in addition to that, uh, would be uh, uh, less actual initiation of a motion response because there are going to be fewer things that are the triggers, fewer things that are interpreted as being self-relevant. Have you um, looked into the different types of meditation? I don't mean the Zen, but the insight meditation versus loving kindness, because when there is a lot of insight meditation, that's that that's more of a vertical power that is developed in the uh, meditator, as opposed to the uh, the loving kindness, which is horizontal. So. Sometimes, like the monks would be up on a tree for seven, for seven years, they just come down, you know, to deprecate, go up there, and the elephants are there, and they're they're very powerful. But then, when they go to the village, they're very um, uh, inept. Uh, so they always try to go to the village. So they develop this other connection thing with the horizontal. You know? okay. So has there been any studies? Yeah, yeah so, the, so the question has to do with, with comparisons of different uh, types of meditation, different styles of meditation. And the answer is, in terms of head-to-head -head comparisons, no. And very little of that. So most everything has, has been uh, separate studies of people you know, practicing in different traditions and then simply trying to you know, compare the results, uh, but not uh, you know, comparing them within one particular paradigm. And that's something important to be done because these are not all uniform. Uh, there may be uh, class similarities between them. Some of them may result in the, the same uh, changes over time. Uh, but what uh, a contemplative science ought to look like is a more differentiated understanding of how these have specific as well as general effects. Yeah, wait till the uh, the, the understanding that you have now of these uh, sort of problems associated with short-term meditation, uh, does this understanding lead to any suggestions for meditation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, keep doing it. I think we're going to have to stop. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, Al, will, uh, Al will be available to talk to people in front if you would like to. Thanks so much.